Good afternoon, Europe, and good morning, America. Thank you for joining today's AJC Europe Connects and Advocacy Anywhere webinar hosted by the AJC Transatlantic Institute and AJC Berlin. Joining us today to discuss transatlantic policy on Iran are Anna Hotiga, former foreign minister of Poland and current member of the European Parliament, sitting on the Foreign Affairs Committee. We also have Ahmed Noripur, member of the German Bundestag, also sitting on the Foreign Affairs Committee and who is the Green Party spokesperson on foreign relations. And finally, Mark Dubovitz, Chief Executive of the Foundation for Defense of Democracies, who has advised the Bush, Obama, and Trump administrations on Iran policy and has the distinct honor of being sanctioned by Iran. After we hear from our guests, we will take your questions using the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen. Remco and Daniel, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Eric. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, dear friends, it's a great pleasure to be with all of you today for our webinar, a co-production between AJC Berlin and the uh, AJC Transatlantic Institute in Brussels. Before we tackle the, the foreign policy challenges posed by the Iranian regime, I, I would like to first discuss the human rights situation inside the country. Anna, uh, you were at the forefront uh, of a European Parliament resolution in December condemning the regime's crackdown of protests that killed maybe 1,500 people, maybe more. Did the human rights situation in Iran improve at all during the first years of the nuclear deal as some had hoped? And how much of a priority are human rights in Iran uh, for its foreign policy in Europe? Well, yes, uh, allow me, thank you for, for, for hosting me, first of all, I am really very grateful for being, being given this opportunity <coughs> to speak to, to all of you. Um, yes, we were lucky within the European Parliament because uh, actually we did not foresee this kind of, of uh, disaster, pandemic, naturally. And the uh, majority of, of MEPs wanted to postpone the debate. Luckily, we decided eventually to, to assess uh, the situation after wave of, of protests and, and uh, uh, really brutally uh, crushed uh, by, by uh, the Iranian uh, regime of, of, of mullahs. Um, we, we were assessing the situation, seeing the scope of, of protests and, and brutality of, of crashing. Actually, the, 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 this wave was uh, present all over the country, over mm. 30 provinces of, of the country. And actually, according to, to our knowledge, it, it was uh, over 1,500 uh, victims with, with uh, unknown, actually, number of, of people uh, in prisons. Mm. Uh, according to, to my knowledge, the uh, situation has deteriorated uh, uh, because actually those in prison uh, were, were simply uh, abandoned. Uh, eventually later, the, it was the, 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 the several stages of, of uh, releasing people from prisons. But uh, in my opinion, it was because uh, of the actually lack of, of possibilities to tend to, to, to coronavirus victims. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, there is a problem because actually Iran is, uh, uh, in my opinion, uh, one of, of very few countries refusing any help from outside. Uh, it was uh, the proposal from from the U.S. Even uh, uh, physicians uh, without borders, French organization, well-known French organization, was uh, simply expelled from 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 the country. So they were not able to 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 assist uh, Iranian people in terms of purely humanitarian aid. And we know that uh, 
the, 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 the coronavirus has uh, dire effects in, in Iran, uh, uh, starting also with, with the links between uh, Iran and, and China uh, via the, 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 the uh, school, religious school in, in uh, Qom, uh, the, the uh, sacred uh, place of, of uh, Iran. Uh, at the very beginning of the uh, pandemic, uh, the, the spiritual leader of Iran uh, or, or authorities of Iran started to hint about eventual uh, Chinese influence on, on, on uh, um, the dispersing of, of pandemics in Iran. But, but after just a few days, everything was, was abandoned and, and uh, we even see similar narratives directed to, to outside, to international community following accusations uh, of false accusations vis-a-vis uh, -vis United States for, for um, uh, the pandemics. Uh, uh, there is a problem. Uh, Iran is impoverished and in uh, actually ordinary people, in particular those who used to, to oppose the uh, regime, are simply prevented uh, medical assistance in, in, in combating oh. uh, COVID-19. So, so overall, human rights situation is, is still really dire and, and uh, all of us, we are locked down, but, but uh, of course, uh, every country, every democratic uh, state, be, being it EU or, or uh, America, US, Canada, uh, other countries uh, do at most to, 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 to assist people. Surely right. uh, Iranian people are, are, are prevented uh, um, real, real assistance and access to, to, to uh, medical help. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Anna. Um, so Omid, maybe taking a step back and um, looking at human rights, the human rights situation in Iran and taking a step back from the COVID situation and the recent protest or the protest uh, at the beginning of the year or end of last year. Um, I mean, last year, according to human rights organization, we have seen uh, that the regime has executed 280 people, among them some minors or people that were minor while committing the crime. Um, we're still seeing that the minority of the Baha'i, the religious minority of the Baha'i, is brutally prosecuted. And so, so even under the sometimes so-called moderate Rouhani, the human rights situation hasn't improved. Um, what, is, what is your take on what needs to be done to improve the situation for ordinary Iranians and to, to improve the human rights situation as a whole? Um, there are lot of um, um, dimensions of the, of the violation of human rights in Iran. Uh, we could spend more than one hour just, just to address them and just, just, just to mention it. Uh, let me just um, go for three uh, dimensions of that. First one is, uh, as uh, uh, Mrs. Fatiga just, just uh, correctly referred to the question of, of, of those people who have been killed after the protest last year. And those people who are under arrest or persecuted. And we know that a lot of people still will be executed because of that, because they peacefully demonstrated against, against uh, the policies of, of the, uh, the old regime. Um, the numbers I got from Iran is minimally one eight. So, so 1800 people has been killed in, um, at least in Iran, could, could even be more. Second, um, the corona situation now in prison, which is disastrous. And we see and we know cases of, of, of uh, political prisoners who shouldn't be prisoners, who are uh, now uh, infected even and then do not get proper uh, medical treatment. Uh, one example is this Sami Rajabi, who is who's an environmentalist, who is just trying to, you know, his, his, uh, he, he was working on how to protect wildlife in Iran and, and now he's, he's in prison. 
um, the question of, uh, of miners and uh, that they are executed in Iran also, by the way, is, has been the core of the activities of Nasri and Satude, who received the Human Rights Award of the European Parliament a couple of years ago and is now in prison and, um, and is detained for 37 years, I think, um, which is unbelievable. Uh, but the question of, of, of the prisons in days is, is crucial and it's, it's obvious that we have to address it now. And to be honest, I'm missing the loud voice uh, uh, working on this and, and, and addressing that in, in Europe. And mm. to be honest, in the entire um, um, international community. And the last one is Corona and then the way which is dealt there, having the revolutionary guards talking about the machine they, uh, they invented now, who, which, can, um, which can detect the Corona virus because of its magnetic aura uh, in, 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 in an outreach in the range of, of, of 100 meters. It's, it's not only fake and crazy, this is super dangerous for, for, for the entire population of Iran. So the way um, Mr. Khamenei is, is talking about the, uh, the, the virus, the way the regime is, is uh, dealing with that is not a, a proper way how you should deal with your own population. And this is the, 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 the last of a lot of things we should we should address. I would love to to um, uh, uh, to address now. I just would love to disagree on one single um, thing at the beginning. Uh, the, the question was after the JCPA, people thought that the, the human rights situation you know would get better. Um, I know that there is a heavy load of uh, acceptations put on, on on the deal, beginning with the, foreign, with the then foreign minister of the United States uh, with. Um, John Kerry and a lot of other foreign ministers also saying that Iran now could be a normal partner. I never believed in that, but this does not mean that the substance of, of, of the deal has been wrong. And this is why, and I know that's going to be a controversy on that after that, but I just want to, want to, want to start with that. Uh, this is why we still try to, to keep the deal as, as Europeans, because we don't, want to, we don't want Iran getting the ball. It doesn't help on human rights. It doesn't help on uh, Iran's aggressions in Syria, in Lebanon, in Iraq, and other places, but it's uh, it's the last barrier against uh, against the Iranian able. Thank you, thank you very much. So, Mark, also for you, the question: How do you assess the human rights situation in Iran? Maybe can you elaborate um, a bit about what, uh, or how, on how the current administration is addressing the human rights issue in Iran? And I mean, you. Omid has said that he wished that the European Union would be louder in calling out the human rights violation in Iran. And where do you see maybe we can uh, connect again through the over the Atlantic um, in calling out the Iranian regime's human rights violations, the European Union and the United States? Well, first of all, thank you so much for having me on. And thank you to, to AJC for hosting these great events. I think uh, that's exactly right. I do think there's an opportunity for Europeans and Americans to come together on the situation, which obviously is atrocious inside Iran. The human rights abuses are, are abysmal. Uh, the administration here has certainly taken steps in terms of designating some of the most notorious human rights abusers inside the Iranian regime, those responsible in the Ministry of Justice and the Intelligence Services and the Revolutionary Guards for the brutal crackdown on Iranians. Um, I think we've been disappointed in Washington about the European response. I think that obviously there's a, a great desire to keep the JCPOA and we can have a whole debate about the nuclear deal and is it accomplishing what it was intended to accomplish, even in the narrowest nuclear sense. But certainly that debate over the nuclear elements should not distract us from a consensus, a transatlantic consensus on addressing the egregious human rights abuses of this regime. I do think that there was a sense in Washington, though I think in Europe as well in 2015, that by doing the nuclear deal, by flooding the hard men of Tehran with cash and integrating them into the global economy, that we could moderate this regime. And that in moderating this regime, it would stop its repression, its destructive behavior in the region. Uh, and then ultimately, when the restrictions on the nuclear deal expired or sunset over a period of a decade, and Iran emerged with an industrial-sized nuclear program that was near zero nuclear breakout that was powered by advanced centrifuges that gave it an easier clandestine sneak out, that it wouldn't matter because at that point, Iran would look more like 
uh, Japan than uh, North Korea. And I use those two countries in Asia as examples because Japan has an industrial sized nuclear program and near zero nuclear breakout, but Japan is a liberal democracy that respects the rights of its citizens. North Korea, on the other hand, is a abusive Stalinist regime that represses its people and has nuclear weapons and is developing intercontinental ballistic missiles. And I think there was an assumption that Iran would end up over a decade to a decade and a half as it got flooded with cash and integrated in the global economy, it would become more like Japan, more of a moderate country uh, and a responsible stakeholder in the global system and less like North Korea. And I think that was the prevailing assumption. So the, the human rights issue, the question of moderation and the nuclear program itself were very much interlinked because if they weren't, then it made no sense. Then the nuclear deal ultimately would give Iran patient pathways to nuclear weapons and intercontinental ballistic missiles as the restrictions sunsetted and expired. Uh, so you really hope that Iran would moderate, but of course it hasn't moderated. And that assumption was always faulty in that this regime could ever moderate. Um, so I think the, the question of human rights and the respect for human rights is an essential question. It's mm -hmm. indispensable as part of the debate, and it needs to be part of both American policy and European policy going forward. Right. So um, even though we didn't really intend to relitigate the JCPOA, of <laughs> course, it somehow happened. But um, uh, let's address something very acute, which, which you refer to some of the sunset clauses, because some of the perhaps lesser known details of the nu nuclear deal is that it will also lift uh, the UN weapons embargo uh, against Iran already now by uh, coming October which would allow Tehran to buy um, advanced weapons from Russia and or, or, or China. Um, I'm not sure too many European policymakers uh, who are not Iran experts and, 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 and are focusing on this deal uh, were aware of, of the implication in, in, in the conventional weapons uh, arena of this deal. Uh, so we, we know, and we'll get to Mark later on, the US is trying hard to, to, at the UN Security Council, to prevent this from happening. But so far, I haven't heard much from, from the EU or, or even individual member states uh, like France and Britain who are on the Security Council, even though the, Europe says it's very much committed to, to Israel's security and, and, and obviously advanced weapons in the hands of the Iranians would have an impact on that. So, um, Anna, uh, how should Europe position itself in this debate um, um, as, as, as you know, in, in, in particular in New York and the UN Security Council um, and on, on the question of how we can uh, um, extend the weapons embargo. I'm in very special position, as you know very well, Daniel, because both of us, we, we engage on quite early stage in debates within European Parliament. I must admit I was very skeptical about GCPOA from the very beginning and when we speak about human rights, we have to remember that, that huge protests uh, started uh, after ordinary people learning that uh, kleptocratic regime did not uh, uh, distribute benefits from freezing of, of funds coming out uh, of, of JCPOA, the result of this among uh, people to, to allow society to, 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 to develop because of this. So it was simply taken by elite and used for, for very vicious actions, including actions in the region, also in, on, on European territory. It was financing of, of terrorist hmm. actions. So there are many, many um, arguments to, to, to continue arms embargo. And actually myself, even after my own experience from, from martial law Poland, I know that people who are, in, who, who, who are intimidated uh, support international community being firm. Mm. against regime, oppressing regimes uh, and, and therefore, believe me myself, I, I lived through sanctions against uh, communist Poland at that time because of martial law and, and being uh, 
person who, 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 who was against communism, I supported those sanctions. Simply, I, I, I could live without a chicken, uh, Sunday chicken, uh, but, but thinking about possibility of, of uh, I'll, I'll simply overthrowing the communist regime was was uh, really something that that uh, was was very important for all of us. So I believe I I know many Iranians, and I know that uh, they in in vast majority they feel oppressed. They are oppressed, and they do not support this regime. So so I am for. Uh, further sanctions. I know legal, uh, international legal uh, um, obstacles. Most probably, it will be very difficult to, to find consensus within uh, UN Security Council. And surely, in this situation, especially in in post-COVID uh, crisis, many countries feel probably temptation to, to trigger economy by, by, by uh, increase arms exports. Surely, I'm, I'm absolutely sure Russia is going to do this and, and China as well. But, but we should stay firm, I'm sure. Thanks. Thank you. Um, I have the I same have the question same. For, for Omid, um, and I know that Omid now would like to discuss all the technical details of the JCPOA, and, uh, <laughs> but we can have a separate discussion about that. But um, simply put, um, what do you expect from the German government? Um, how should the German government act um, when the weapons embargo expires in October? Mm. And, um, I mean, what do you expect? I mean, as Anna has said, very likely it is Russia and China that are willing to sell weapons to the Iranians. Um, it's not Europe, it's not Germany. And um, as a member of the Green Party, it's in your DNA to be against weapon export. So um, what, what, what do you want to see from the, what action do you want to see from the German government? Uh, the last time someone referred to my DNA, it was Khamenei talking about Iranian DNA, which will resist against the deadly virus, mm -hmm. which is part of that, what I mentioned before, which is very highly, highly um, um, dangerous for, for Iranian people to, to listen to, to such, such a leader. Um, let me, if I may, first make a few points on that, what Mark said before. Uh, starting with, uh, with my admiration for this amazing giant, coffee mug you have there i want to ask them to, <laughs> you know this is that big you know like, it, this could even wake me up okay this is amazing uh, this is america I, know, uh, 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 I i love that i would love to ask this thing uh, first um let me let me come to to the question of human rights in iran which is obviously disastrous uh i would advise not to base the depression on iran only on that one pillar iran's human rights record is, is disastrous Iran's uh, policy in, in the region is, is highly aggressive. Uh, the, the, the way they are uh, announcing repeatedly uh, that they're going to go after Israel's existence is not acceptable. The question of um, uh, the, the ballistic missile, uh, the program of, of, of the country is, is highly risky. I would put all of these this arguments um, uh, together. Just going after the human rights situation there is um, calling for a double standard. Um, 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 question because the, the human rights situation in Saudi Arabia is not that better and Saudi Arabia is a close partner of the way. Uh, mm -hmm. Second, no, I won't go for it for the technical of the JCPOA, but I, I saw Mark the week after, we, we saw each other uh, one week after 8th of May to 18 mm -hmm. when President Trump announced the withdrawal of the Americans from, from the deal. And I fully agree that all of this illusions being uh, being created by, by leaders of a lot of country on what hap gonna happen with Iran the day after. Uh, we both criticized the day after the deal had been made. It was obvious that Iran gonna get money and it was obvious that huge amounts of that won't go into the labor market of the country, but be passed to the Pastagan and they're gonna spend it in Syria for it and, and, and gonna kill people there, gonna kill civilians there. We knew that before. We knew that in, in, in the moment, but uh, the JCPOA uh, made 
one thing possible we did not have before, and this is inspection. And not having the JCPOA means that, that there are no inspections there. Mark told me that, please correct me if I, I'm referring that, I'm quoting you wrong. You, you, you told me that you are not opposing inspections, neither, neither you, you oppose a deal, but you want a better deal. Two years after, there is no other deal. So the question is, will this regime, will the Pasaran be, be stronger or weaker if they had a bomb? And I think this is, this is the core of the JCPA we have to focus on. Not, and then there is no, there is no controversy on the role Iran is playing in, in, in domestically and internationally and uh, regionally. Um, when it comes to the, um, to the uh, arms cell uh, boycott, obviously uh, we, are, we are pushing our government and it's not a question of, of my party only. Uh, all of the democratic parties in the Bundestag are in favor of, of an extension. Um, and, and I do not think that then my government is, is, is opposing that. Because of the reason we, we have in common and maybe you were referring to, um, obviously it's, it's, a, it's, it's necessary that Iran does not get new weapons and is not also not able to, to sell weapons to, to its proxies or to deliver pro legally uh, um, uh, weapons to its proxies in the region. Um, to be honest, the bad thing for the last two years has been that Germany and most of the European countries um, were in cooperation with China much closer than with the America when it came to Iran because we tried to save the JCPOA to keep the neighborhood country of us uh, nuclear free. And this is why um, it's now complicated to, 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 to work on that. I'm happy to see that uh, the American um, administration and the American, and this is a bipartisan issue, I think, and in the Congress there is, 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 uh, is uh, trying to, to, to push for, for an extension. And it's obvious that Europe has to, to stand together there and then we have to stand with the Americans in the UN Security Council but it's getting more and more complicated to find a common sense on that with, with, with China. After the two, two last years, it's getting even more complicated. So before we turn to the man with a gigantic coffee mark, uh, I just wanna also point out uh, to our worldwide viewers that um, we will come to a point where we will take questions from you. And there is a, in, a question and answer button where you can type those um, and we will get to them uh, in a few minutes. Um, Mark, um, you know, for, for those who haven't spent the last few years studying uh, the J JCPOA, uh, perhaps you can very briefly also explain a little bit what's going on at the Security Council and what is the snapback option um, that, that the U.S. is threatening in case there is no new agreement on um, extending uh, the arms embargo by consensus. And, and, and do, you, do you think, I mean, from, from your reading um, of the White House, whether uh, the US administration would really go through with it. Yeah, thank you. By the way, my, my giant coffee mug, I don't know if people know, but when Michael Bloomberg was mayor of New York, he tried to ban big gulp sodas. Um, so as a, as a libertarian now, I'm in defense of <laughs> big gulp coffee mugs. And I will, uh, I will defend my home against the federal government's attempt to take it away. Um, look, the, the question of the, the UN arms embargo obviously is something that should unite Americans and Europeans. It's a serious, serious issue, right? It, the expiration of that embargo means that the regime in Iran will be able to buy uh, fighter jets, attack helicopters, battle tanks, maybe warships. Uh, as Omid said, they'll be able to proliferate these weapons throughout the Middle East. Uh, it'll make the Middle East even more dangerous. It'll create more destruction. More destruction means more refugees uh, potentially flooding into Europe. This is a significant threat to Europe, uh, probably even more so than the United States, not to mention a, a threat to our allies in the region. So I think the, the international consensus, at least the transatlantic consensus, should be clear that the arms embargo should be extended. But of course, as both speakers have said, it's very unlikely that the Chinese and Russians will agree to this because they stand to make tens of billions of dollars in selling weaponry to the regime in Iran. The administration's position is very clear that if the arms embargo is not extended, the US will move to unilaterally snap back the UN sanctions. Uh, and the State Department's legal office has given an opinion that the US has that right to do so, despite the fact that the US is no longer part of the JCPOA, 
because the U.S. is, according to U.N. Security Council Resolution 2231, which essentially was the resolution that concretized or legitimized the JCPOA at the Security Council, uh, it, the U.S. is still a member state and still a member of uh, the JCPOA per the definition. So the unilateral right that was negotiated by the Obama administration, by the way, to the credit of the Obama administration, they negotiated this because I think they foresaw in the future that there wouldn't be international consensus on a range of issues, particularly with respect to Iran's violations of the deal. They negotiated the unilateral snapback. That snapback is there. The US believes that they have the legal right to snapback and they are using the, the prospect of snapback uh, to try and encourage Russia and China to agree to an extension. So I think if we don't see an extension, we're going to see snapback. And that means all the UN Security Council resolutions come back, including the one that prohibits the sale and, and purchase of conventional weaponry, but also the one that prohibits Iran from developing ballistic missiles. Uh, that's set to expire in 2023. There's also the other resolutions that will come back are resolutions that prohibit Iran from enriching uranium and reprocessing plutonium, which was the international position, the international consensus before the JCPOA and before the JCPOA gave Iran effectively a right to create fissile material on its own soil for the development of nuclear weapons. By the way, a right that uh, most countries in the world don't have and don't uh, don't use. There are actually 20 countries in the world with civilian nuclear programs that don't have enrichment or reprocessing on their soil and buy nuclear fuel from abroad. The countries that do have that right include Iran, and Iran obviously has proven itself in the past uh, to be a state sponsor of terrorism and a violator of uh, UN Security Council resolutions and is engaged in a illicit and mendacious nuclear program. So it's very clear that the US position will be to continue to drive forward on extending the arms embargo and then otherwise snap back the sanctions if the Russians and Chinese block that. Right. Um, so we could be in a situation where the US would go for the snap back option, but that the Russians and Chinese say they don't accept it. They may continue to argue that the U.S. had no right to do so and may proceed with arms sales. Um, maybe a question sort of for all of, uh, for all of you, where do you see Europe then, you know, positioning itself? Would, would, would Europe be then on the side of the U.S. on this question or uh, be on the side of Russia and China? Amit or uh, Anna? Well, I think it will be it will be very difficult to to find really firm transatlantic uh, common stance on this, uh, knowing positions of of a variety of of governments. Yet I, I'm uh, absolutely sure that earlier. Uh, Optimism uh, is, is uh, over, and, and uh, um, uh, we have to assess overall situation. I, I think that uh, uh, Europe is aware of, of uh, uh, vicious uh, activities of, of China in many areas, uh, also aggressive posture of Russia. So, so I hope that at least it will be easier to push for this. Mm. I, I, but right. uh, honestly speaking, I think there is much work ahead of us to, right. to, to obtain this. Uh, uh, I do not think yeah. it is a common Sorry. sense that Americans are part of the deal. And to be honest, for the last two years, we asked our American friends, why if they're thinking that Iran is cheating, uh, why they do not just stay within the deal and snap back um so and you know this is this is what what this is what the, a policy which is not looking that reasonable uh, americans wanted iran to to be punished for for that what they think it is a violation of the deal they could snap it all the time uh, and now for the last two years and this was something really really painful to, to admit to for the last two years 
we tried to, to save the deal and uh, with, with the Chinese and and, 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 and and the Russians. And these are not our partners. These are not our friends. The Americans are. And this is what, what I'm not sure, and I just can, can, um, can agree with that, what Anna just said. Uh, I'm not sure that it's going to be a common sense within the European Union that America is just ready to snap back at the day where they want to. And referring to the elder resolutions of the United Nations Security Council doesn't mean that they can be connected to the snapback because snapback is part of the deal, not part of the international mechanism. All right. Um, uh, Anna, uh, very briefly on, on uh, Iran's regional aggression and specifically uh, what's very important for us uh, at AGC, certainly um, Iran's most important proxy, Hezbollah, uh, um, which it's using, you know, uh, in, in, in Syria and in, in other arenas. Germany just outlawed the terror group. Uh, do you think, um, you know, consensus in the EU we don't have yet, but do you think we could see other member states follow this example, maybe even Poland? I think it is uh, quite feasible that other other member states uh, consider this. I would like to, to remind all of you that uh, together with uh, British MAPs during my first term in the European Parliament 15 years ago, we, uh, after assassination of uh, Rafi Kariri and, and, and seeing uh, developments in Iran, then Hezbollah uh, uh, simply coming to, 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 to power, we, we voiced uh, support for outlawing Hezbollah, uh, putting on terrorist list, European terrorist list, uh, because all, all these actions at that time, now we are much wiser. We, we know really vicious uh, activities. Uh, we know that actually many, many of, of, of uh, uh, cover-up uh, actions by Iran are now, now quite visible and, and we see much more about activities and open financing of, of uh, um, very uh, well, uh, aggressive actions of, of Hezbollah in the region. Uh, there is uh, a simple uh, feeling of alliance uh, in, in approaching to a variety of issues in, 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 in Syria and, and elsewhere. Um, so I, I, I think uh, much depends, of course, also on, on, on initiatives within the EU, but, but mm -hmm. I see possibilities for, for um, much more, I would say, sober actions of member states vis-a-vis -vis Iran. Thanks. Thank you. So also the same question to you, Omid. Um, what can Europe, what can Germany do to push back on uh, Iran's regional aggression? Um, where we look at Iraq, uh, Syria, Yemen, uh, Lebanon. And what always strikes me here in Berlin is that we always think of this Iranian behavior in the region as something that is far away and that doesn't concern us, while in fact, when we look at the refugee situation in 2015, we have to, we have to face the fact that most of them fled the Assad regime, its Iranian, uh, its Iranian uh, allies, the Russians, and all the Shia militias uh, propped up by the Iranian regime. So this is something that is, that is fundamentally important for the stability of Germany, but also for the stability of, of Europe as a whole. And um, what do you think, I mean, apart from the JCPOA, just talking about Iran's regional aggression, what, what needs to be done? Uh, there are three different answers for these three different uh, uh, countries, but there is one thing all of them have in common. Iran is filling a vacuum which, uh, or the emptiness, uh, we, we left over for them. Um, and in Lebanon, it's, uh, it's I would say, that it, it is the heaviest task because of the Hezbollah there being so entangled with the, with the institutions. Um, but obviously, um, the, the people of Lebanon are fed up of Iranian imperialism, and this is what they call it. I was in, in, in Beirut in November, I think, and when the, the protests started there, 
uh, I went to to the demonstrations where we're delighted to see this this inspiring young people going out saying, "Hey, this is my country, and I want to I, I want to get back my sovereignty." Um, this is, of course, not only about Iran, but Iran is a ma 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 major player there. And uh, what we're seeing now in these days is that people are going out of the quarantine and they go out to the streets, and because of their uh, uh, financial and economic still. Uh, misery they are there and they go out and then and, and protest again on our uh, badly harmed by, by, by Hezbollah militias who are backed by Iran. Uh, so the question is, is to, to is, it is the most complicated one because in Lebanon you need a long term strategy to, to establish uh, strong institutions they didn't have for the last decade. Um, and in Syria, um, it's maybe already done, but it's obvious that Iran is not getting stronger there um, um, and it's obvious that there are huge frictions between between Iran Hezbollah uh, sorry, Iran uh, Iran and Hezbollah on one hand and Assad and then uh, and the, uh, the Russians on the third hand and we have also Turkey in. and it's obvious that Iran in this um, in this uh, uh, line of, of, of power players is the weakest um, we, we, we heard the Israeli defense minister I think uh, recently announcing that Iran's withdrawal from, from Syria has started. I think it's, it's, it's right. Uh, Iraq is um, the key country for Iran. It's more, must, much more important than the other ones. Um, and it's obvious that Iran needs a security, it says, it needs a reform of the security forces there. Uh, to be honest, after the American withdrawal draw there, nobody properly invested into that. Um, there had been tiny training missions, they were not that bad. It's completely different in the North, by the way. Well, when we, when we talk about Iran's influence here, we have to talk about Baghdad and not about Heavy. Um, it's, it's obvious that, that we have to invest much more, not only because of, uh, of uh, the sovereignty of the country, not only for, for, for pushback against Iran, but also because obviously Iraq is the key country where we have to, uh, to defeat uh, uh, jihadism. Um, but Iran is not the, the, the help for that. Uh, they are helpful when it comes to 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 holding cities against the Mad, uh, Mad Max uh, army coming from, from from ISIL. But at the end of the day, the narrative of the jihadists is we they are the only one who are protecting Sunni, and the Sunnis feel oppressed because of the Shia militias who are backed by Iran. So it's it's obvious that Iran is, is part of the problem there. And and if uh, we want to tackle jihadism within our societies and cities in, in the West. We have to, to take care on, 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 on Iraq much more than we did for the last years. Okay, thank you. So we're, we have 15 minutes left. So we now switch to the Q&A and uh, Eric is taking over now. Sure, we have tons of questions. I'll try to combine some of them. Our first one is for Mr. Dubowitz from Merrill Horowitz, board member of the AJC Transatlantic Institute. Question is, how is the Iranian regime being viewed internationally now that the virus is running rampant inside the country's borders? Have its activities in the region changed due to the virus? Thank you for that question. Yeah, Merle. I, th I think the perception of the regime, I think, is now one of, uh, of incompetence and mendacity. You know, I, and I think that's just compound in that perception. The, the regime, obviously, early on, denied that the COVID-19 virus was spreading in Iran. Um, they, in fact, responded by encouraging millions of Iranians to go to the streets to both vote in the parliamentary elections and to celebrate the 41st anniversary of the Islamic Revolution, knowing that they had a crisis, um, but obviously didn't disclose that to the people. And when they finally acknowledged it, um, you know, I think Omid has done a good job of describing some of the really ridiculous uh, reactions that you've gotten from the regime, from the Revolutionary Guards. The, the crisis is obviously very acute inside Iran, and they've denied uh, humanitarian aid. They've been they've refused support from the United States, um, and but they've been running running a global propaganda campaign of disinformation to try and persuade international leaders and the international publics that the reason that they can't cope with COVID nineteen is because of sanctions, because of U.S. sanctions, which of course is not true. They have been able to receive pharmaceutical sales from Europe, uh, which have not actually ebbed in recent years. 
They have billions of dollars in money sitting in escrow accounts around the world that they can use to buy humanitarian goods and U.S. sanctions contain exemptions uh, for humanitarian trade. They have banks on the SWIFT financial messaging system that they can use to transact. And the Supreme Leader himself, as I'm sure Omid would tell you, has hundreds of billions of dollars in these boniads and these foundations and in his corporate uh, hedge fund that he can use for health relief. So they haven't responded with any degree of confidence inside Iran. I think that perception is clear around the world. Their regional aggression also, I think the only reason it's diminished in any way over the recent uh, year or so is because of the maximum pressure campaign that the United States has run. And I think the killing of Qasem Soleimani, which we haven't talked about at all on this uh, webinar, has really had a profound impact on Iran's regional abilities, capabilities, and strategies. Because Soleimani, to the extent that any person is irreplaceable, is irreplaceable. And his, uh, his replacement does not have the expertise, the regional connections, and they are, they are in disarray in Syria, in Iraq, and in Lebanon in the ways that, that Omid described. I think that's a combination of both losing Soleimani and the fact that, as he said, people around the Middle East are rejecting the Iranian imperialism and, and the Revolutionary Guards and the Quds Force's destruction. I guess Omid wants to, wants to answer. There is just one, one disagreement on the question of, of the impact of the sanctions. Obviously, 80% of the disaster in Iran is because of mismanagement and corruption. And I don't want to, there's no way to deny that. And, and people in Iran know that. Um, but um, first, there are countries and, and international players who are now having business with Iran. And this business is not taking place with the private sector, but with the past Iran, because there are those who are. Uh, uh, who are the masters of the hubs of, of, of the ports and the airports of the country. And they are going on, not that way they did before, uh, but, but they, they go on um, uh, 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 having business and then the private sector is not. Second, um, if uh, it's not the way that European companies are now able to, to sell uh, meds to Iran. This is super complicated and to be honest, they are they're hesitating because they're afraid of secondary sanctions. They do, they, I'm dealing with them all the day. They, they, they be, and this is obviously a, a question of, of European sovereignty to, 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 to deal with that also. And I just can't repeat, 80% of the disaster in Iran is domestically made. It's because of the, the, the regime's mismanagement and corruption. But in the moment when they are not able to, to, to buy test kits because European country, it, companies are hesitating to, tell, to, to sell them those, because they're afraid of the American reaction to that, it's a problem. And if we want to wait for the 80% uh, to, to, to be resolved to be, before we can help the Iranians in the COVID situation, we can wait for a little bit longer than the impact we could have if we try to, to change the other 20%. So we have a second question for everyone to answer from your own country's perspective. How was the German ban on Hezbollah received in the rest of Europe and in the United States? What does the German government ex expect from its European counterparts on this issue? I can't I'll refer to the reactions of other people to our actions, so. Very short, Anna. Well, I think that uh, the, the, the perception is positive of, of, of uh, German action and, and I think that uh, uh, other countries uh, should, should take similar, similar actions. Also you, we expect from high representative uh, to be more outspoken and, and, and more um, visible in, in presenting views on the situation of, of uh, Iran. Um, on sanctions, shortly on sanctions, I think that uh, sanctioned countries, also Russia, because of, of illegal annexation of Crimea, tend to use COVID-19 as, as uh, pretext or argument to, 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 to launch uh, huge uh, disinformation and propaganda campaigns uh, 
uh, trying to, 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 to convince uh, free societies about necessity of, of uh, easing sanctions or, or lifting sanctions uh, because of, of uh, the fate of ordinary people. It has nothing to do with ordinary people, actually, mm -hmm. because it is elites and, and kleptocratic regimes uh, profiting from, from this. Right. Amit wanted to respond. Thank you. Thank you. I, I, I fully agree with what Anna Fatika just said on Russia, and, and we are we are one of the stands here against those people who say that because of the, the pandemics, uh, pan pandemic, the, the sanctions against Russia has to be lifted. There is no no uh, reasonable connection between the two cases. Um, and uh, but, but what we are seeing is um, uh, on, on, in the single case of Iran, what, what I said before that that uh, medical companies are hesitated to to sell them. Um, uh, medical good. I have to add, and this is this should be forgotten also. Uh, but I, I think it was Mark starting with that at the beginning, or it was I, I, I don't know. But we have a situation in Iran when 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 the regime is trying to push back help, where when it's they are they are, they do not let Médecins Sans Frontières coming in, and so mm. it, it's even more complicated. <clears throat> Therefore, I would say that it's part of the blame game also to, 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 take, him, to, to take away this excuse. Right. Um, I have here yeah, no, a question. If I oh, could just sorry, respond Mark, really please. quickly to, sure. yeah, just to your, to your Hezbollah question. Um, certainly, I think the, the U.S. government has been very appreciative of the move by Germany and by the U.K. I think there is still disbelief in Washington that the French government still clings to this really outdated view that there are two wings of Hezbollah, that somehow there's a political wing and a military wing. Uh, they you know, certainly have supported the designation of the military wing, but have not supported the designation of the, the political wing. Uh, Hassan Nasrallah himself, the, the head of Hezbollah, has obviously dismissed that. I mean, he has said that we are not a two-winged organization. We are a unitary organization. And so I think it is long past the time for the French government to move beyond this very outdated and anachronistic view that there are two wings of Hezbollah operating separately. And I'm glad to see Germany and the UK and the Netherlands and certainly other countries around the world moving in that direction. I'll say one other thing about this issue of sanctions and humanitarian relief. Um, the European trade data with Iran is very clear. I'm happy to send it to everybody who wants to see it. There's been no change in the exports of European pharmaceuticals to Iran over the past number of years, including with the reimposition of sanctions by this administration. So the central bank governor of Iran himself has admitted that Iran got $15 billion worth of humanitarian goods and essential goods last year. And obviously all of this is taking place despite concerns in the private sector. And because the United States has provided exemptions and a Swiss humanitarian channel to facilitate the sale of these goods. May, 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 I, may I, uh, excuse me, I, let, let me, let me once, uh, just once referred to the, to, the, to that what we did in the German Bundestag and Hezbollah and what's going on in this country. Mm. Because I fully agree with what, what has been said that there is no this artificial division between the, the military and political arm of Hezbollah. But this is not what, what Germany has tackled because we can. This is, has been a practical decision of, of the European Union for, uh, for some kind of a deal with a country where the, the health minister is, is a member of the Hezbollah. Um, of course, it's an artificial one, but this is a European Council's um, and, and Commission's um, decision. We didn't tackle that. What we did was to, to ask our government, and they are now doing it, uh, implement that finally, and we're very happy about that. What we asked our government was to prohibit and, and implement the whole prohibition of any kind of activity of Hezbollah and its proxies in Germany for not going on funding, funding and, and, and recruiting personnel for, for the for jihadism in, in Germany, and this is what happened. And we are happy that, that it's, it's now uh, finally happening. I know that the political sign of that was much bigger than that what um, substantially has been done, but it's, it's a good sign also to the people I just referred to in, in Lebanon who are uh, desperately trying to push back his father's influence. Right. And we Thank applaud. You. I, I think just, just, I just wanted to say we applaud the Green Party and all the other mm -hmm. democratic parties in the German Bundestag who also put pressure on the government to 
uh, to finally uh, ban Hezbollah activities in Germany. So we, you know, we very, we're very aware of your role and the role of all parties and especially also the Green Party. So I hate to interrupt, but I'm being told that we need to wrap it up. We have a very hard deadline. So I want to thank you panelists for taking the time to speak about these issues that continue to confront the United States and Europe. I also want to thank our audience for joining us and showing your commitment to these issues in these unique times. While there are so many of us separated from our family and friends, AJC is still bringing us together on policy that matters most. To stay up to date on all of AJC Advocacy, Any Advocacy Anywhere programs, please visit ajc.org slash advocacy anywhere. Thank you again for joining us today. I'm sorry we couldn't get to all of your questions, but please stay healthy, stay safe, and goodbye, everybody. Goodbye. Thank, Thank you very you. much. Goodbye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. <laughs>